So welcome to this uh, webinar on carrier scale network security. Uh, the topic of this particular webinar is uh, increasing threat detection uh, and reducing your incident response. Uh, my name is Martin Rudd uh, and uh, the webinar should take somewhere around 45 minutes, uh, maybe a bit less. And if you've got any questions throughout, uh, then please email Sarah Chandley or schandley at tduk.com at any point. Uh, the agenda for this webinar is uh, going to go through a quick brief bio uh, of myself. Uh, we're going to go through where the threat presence is in the network. We're going to go and have a look at some of the stakeholder teams in the business. Look at some of the problems which are specific to carrier cybersecurity over and above uh, enterprise or just simply unique to carrier cybersecurity. Uh, we'll then have a look at some of the use cases uh, such as cryptojacking, multi-vector attack, uh, multi-vector attacks which are particularly pre prevalent in carrier networking, and uh, then some mitigation using a technology called BGP flow specs or Border Gateway Patrol flow specs. Uh, we'll have a bit of a roundup at the end, uh, some of the topics and uh, items which have been raised. Uh, but as I say, if you've got any questions throughout the course of this webinar, uh, email schandley at tduk.com and she shall uh, pass them on and we'll, uh, we can discuss them either at the end of the webinar or if I can interject them through, well, she'll do that as well. So myself, I'm a product leader. Uh, I work in three main areas for our business. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the topic of this webinar, which is the carrier scale cybersecurity. Uh, I also work with government and national security projects uh, and operate uh, inside telecoms, but, but really the IP core side, not the radio side, um, and fixed line as well, fixed line networks. So your sort of standard ISPs, if you're uh, it's really any IP network which we are, which we're monitoring. Uh, the projects or the products in the stable uh, are all hardware accelerated platforms, FPGAs, uh, for our probing side uh, to uh, allow us to handle the rate within. Uh, side pla within carrier platforms uh, and, the ca and the rates which we're expecting inside carrier networks. Uh, and then there's software and uh, virtualized network, network function virtualization products as well. Uh, and they all run off commodity hardware, commodity off the shelf hardware. So essentially the, uh, they are the distributed part of, the, uh, of any product. Uh, I have a specialism in highly scalable mesh and grid computing. Uh, so that extends out over and above from FPGA probes into petabyte scale data, uh, machine learning algorithm design, uh, associated analytics, uh, all network related. Uh, but I have a background in equities and derivatives trading, uh, 3D physics um, from animations and, and games and things. Uh, and uh, I work for Telesoft, um, which is an R&D company, been around for about 30 years on the cutting edge um, uh, established in 1989. So if we jump straight in, we have a, a look at what are or where are the threats present in the network. Uh, at this point is a, a good juncture to point out that, uh, uh, as we know, carrier networks are not simple. Uh, they are typically a, a large number of sites or a number of sites, uh, and they have uh, the aspects of the user equipment um, going through which communicates through uh, the physical network, logical network, and potentially services and applications uh, on a per site basis or on a multi-site basis, uh, going through to the internet. Uh, or, and within the internet, we, we, we think of that as uh, both targets and also peers uh, for things like VoIP traffic or peer-to-peer -peer traffic. Uh, the multi-site deployments will be for high availability disaster recovery. It might be some logical network segregation. And by the logical network, we mean both VLANing, but also uh, horizontal network um, federation or segregation, network zoning it's called, network segregation, where there are typically different logical network, uh, different logical layers within the network uh, for security resilience purposes, uh, but also for uh, serving particular applications. Uh, it could also be if you've got pre-production environments, production environments, development environments, they'll be in there as well. There is an added complexity in some types of network, telecoms networks, 
uh, with having a NAT, a network address translation, which I think everybody, by hopefully the, uh, the uh, any, any listeners will know, uh, is to do with using the, uh, there's a finite amount of IPv4 addresses which are out there. Um, there's an even more finite amount, a small number, which are owned by a network. Uh, and that number is less than the number of pieces of user equipment or subscribers. So the network typically has to rotate uh, those public IP addresses or those, 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 those public facing IPv4 addresses on a per flow basis, per internet session basis for each one of the pieces of net user equipment within the network. And that adds a layer of complexity for which I'll we'll come into shortly. Uh, which is to do with traceability and finding out who did what on a network. So where are the threats? Well, they're absolutely all the way through the network. They're within the mesh topology of the network overall. Uh, they are through the physical network, the logical network, and through the services and applications. Because of this, there aren't really that many pinch points in the network. The threats are just throughout. Now, the stakeholder teams within an operator or within a, a carrier are crucial. These are the guys at the forefront of security operations and network management. And each one of these teams, really network operations, forensic and security operations, normally have different needs from the platforms and different, and, and clearly are, are fulfilling different roles, but they have different needs and different, uh, different timescales in which, within which they operate. Uh, to each other, but they typically have to use similar, they share equipment, share security tools, or, or, or share the same knowledge information. So at the very top, you've got the network operations who uh, will connect into storage and analytics for network health uh, using some sort of IP fix collection. Uh, you have uh, forensics who do per incident analysis and uh, investigations. And you've got security operations who run the security operations center, and they'll often have a scene which is being fed by uh, alerts and logs from uh, the various elements of the broad scope elements of the network, so the routing, physical layers, um, the service layer, service and application logs and alerts, and then uh, IPS, uh, intrusion protection systems, intrusion detection systems and firewalls, that side of things. There's a, a lot more, but those are the sort of broad scope terms. And those are all feeding alerts and logs into the, the security incident events management system, which is uh, analyzing and looking for looking for, for threats and looking for um, anomalous behavior uh, and basically alerting uh, the security operations center of, of security events which are being triggered. Now the routing service layers and the IDS and IP, uh, IDS IPS firewall uh, firewalls are often, well, they are, they are distributed throughout the network uh, across multiple sites. It's critical that in order to maintain an effective security strategy, that these three teams or these three groups of teams have their individual uh, requirements satisfied uh, as fully as possible. Uh, the security operations team typically want their information as fast as possible with a lowest latency. Uh, the forensics may be deep diving uh, and in, in slightly slightly lazier time. And by near real time for the security operations, we do mean near real time, sort of sub-second is, is, is the, uh, the time scales in which they operate. The forensics aren't sub-second. Network operations may or may not be. So onto some of the problems which are particularly prevalent, prevalent in carrier cyber. So fundamentally, the, the thing which sets carrier cyber security apart from uh, smaller enterprise cyber security is the high line rates. Uh, when you start moving up through uh, 100 gig to terabits per second, there is a real strength, a uh, real stress on, on the ability of the organization to maintain its visibility at those kind of network rates. They have a limited availability of tools, and those tools typically degrade in latency uh, as the rates increase. Um, and, and, and obviously, uh, that means that the effectiveness of the organization to, to, to fight its cyber attacks or to handle cyber incidents, security incidents, is, is degraded equally. Also, multi -con multiple concurrent multi-vector attacks are the norm. 
So on a carrier, night, carrier network, you're likely to see an awful lot of attacks going on at the same time. And within each one of those attacks, they may or may not be grouped to similar targets. This makes a, a very confused picture for the security operations. So trying to solve that's very important. So how do we combat this? Or what are the sort of uh, approaches which might be useful in uh, tackling some of these issues? So for the visibility issue, uh, you want to be going in terms of make sure that whatever security tools you're using, they can scale in sufficiently large, block, large blocks with scalar networks. Typically in 200 gig blocks is useful. Uh, that allows for uh, a large enough amount of um, a large enough block to be able to move with the expanding data rate of the of the network, expanding line rate of the network, uh, as well as uh, cover enough of the network and and cover cover a sufficient amount of the network so that threats no threat will go undetected. So going ground up and not the top down. The reason why we say this is going from the ground up is so much easier than dealing with going from the top down when you're looking from a content point of view or from a packet point of view. The reason why it's easier is that the network is built on IP addresses which are built on top of uh, transport protocols. There's only a reduced number of transport protocols. Typically you'll see TCP, UDP, ICMP, these sorts of things. Uh, and it's a lot easier to be categorizing from small to large. If you're trying to go from categorizing every single application and every single service and, and application protocol on the network down, well, you're kind of running at a loss leader already because you're, the computation power and the amount of, uh, uh, and, the, and the scale of the system and really the ability of the system to cover only a part of all of the traffic which is capable of being ported over IP. So every, all the internet, every single service and every single, uh, every, everything that you can do, uh, IoT devices, operational technology, handsets, user equipment, uh, the internet, or all of these services, social media, all of these things must be classified individually uh, in order for a top-down approach uh, to work. And that's just really not possible uh, at a carrier level, uh, or at least, not, at least not, not possible with the current technology. Also, when you're dealing with visibility, don't compromise. Uh, there's a, a standard approach is to start sampling um, uh, flows or flow data on the network. So instead of seeing every single flow, in order to try and maintain at least some visibility at, uh, into the terabits per second or the multi-hundred gig a second, uh, what will happen is that you'll have uh, sampling taking place. So maybe one in 8,000 flows, uh, network, uh, network flows will be picked up uh, and forwarded into uh, the security uh, operations center or the seam for analysis. Uh, by virtue of that, it means you're missing one in eight, potentially missing um, 7,999 actual security uh, events, which is uh, just a, a, a very, very, very poor odds to be playing. But also, one of the things which is critical to remember within this is that the carrier owns the playing field. So you guys own the playing field. You're, the, the, the attacker uh, often has the advantage because they're able to change their attack continually uh, to try and outfox, outwit, bypass, manipulate, coerce, or do whatever they do to try and affect their own agenda. Um, and they, because they're constantly changing, um, reacting is 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 is, is always um, not an effect, not not as effective an overall strategy in terms of sort of game theory and the likes uh, as being uh, 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 as being proactive. However, what is within your arsenal is they're playing this game on your playing field, and you can utilize that to your advantage, significant advantage in some cases, uh, against the attacker, uh, and that's often bypassed and. Uh, and uh, you know, kind of, when when you're fighting a, a a battle such as this, one one has to take all of the um, all of the benefits that you can bring uh, and, um, and 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 maximise those. So the availability and latency of tools, in order for these different security teams, different business stakeholder, the different uh, stakeholder teams to be effective, fundamentally, you should be looking around sub-second latency for alerts and responses to um, 
queries or or for having a look in the in the uh, in forensics incident forensics anything more than that and uh, time has passed um, and that's so ideally uh, effective security operations will take place with the capability of the security operations tool uh, to have uh, sub-second alerting and responding from their tools the other thing which is worth remembering here is carrier versus small enterprise tools uh, small enterprise tools uh, or you know kind of open source uh, offerings which have been knocked up um, typically do not scale to carrier uh, and they don't scale in their effectiveness uh, and they may scale um, uh, and, and by effectiveness I mean they may they may not simply work at that sort of rate you might need specific um, hardware technologies and then an, a, a huge amount of development time and still come out have an outcome which is not as uh, not as good as a tool for the design for the job so it's important to recognize here that taking uh, small enterprise tools and trying to scale them up simply won't work that, of course, obfuscates the picture for the security teams as well if their tools aren't performing effectively. So if multi -vector, multi multiple concurrent multi-vector attacks are the norm, then whatever tools you've got, having an automated triage and severity uh, becomes ever critical because if your security operations team are chasing uh, spam with the same vigor and energy and resources they're chasing uh, somebody who's doing data exfiltration on um, credit details or uh, or having some much much more uh, you know kind of distributing malware or crimeware of some description you want to have your security operations team have the system or the plant your tools automatically triage and, and grade and severity the incidents in order they can tackle the most severe ones first uh, so that's about applying your resources as an organization effectively to each security incident which is thrown up. Also, you want to differentiate the targets but group the attacks. Again, this clears the picture significantly. So if you can know if you've if you know that this target is being attacked, but it's being attacked in these different ways, then you can categorize that as an individual attack or an individual incident. If you are trying to see every single individual discrete attack in its own right and then subsequently piece it together and see which ones are to the same targets or which ones are being from the same sources that comes at that comes at a cost that comes at a cost of time and responsiveness uh, at a time when time and responsiveness are at a premium uh, and that's within uh, the reaction or the um, response to a, a security incident other things which are extremely useful are being able to know and classify your attacker. So just we just alluded to, and then it was just alluded to then that if you can group and classify your attacking network, such as a botnet, you will know what they're capable of before they've mounted their next attack. If you know what an attacker's capability is, it is a much much simpler proposition to stop them in their subsequent attacks. You can put up your defenses before they start you can be know what you're looking for your platforms and your tools will know what they're looking for and so that makes a very very effective um, method um, of uh, of mitigating uh, and analyzing attacks and, and significantly clearing the picture and, and also knowing your strategy up front or being able to know your strategy in any particular in, in certain situations up front rather than being reactive you might have a, a an effective playbook which 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 uh, which includes tools and processes and, uh, uh, and, uh, and teams uh, to, to, to mitigate the attack. Also, having a layered threat classification approach becomes ever key as well, because then you can quantify and backstop, um, or, or you can uh, double check, have your layered threat classification double check attacks, so triaging and severity and the like. So don't rely on one source or one uh, particular. Um, one particular instruction or one particular event. Uh, if you if you have a, 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 a provenance to an attack um, from a couple of different sources uh, and they both agree, then that is obviously more useful as a as a response. And it allows again it allows for the automated triage and severity, or it allows to the security operations uh, to automatically triage um, 
uh, and grade, grade. Also, it means that the forensics can have a look and see if the, the uh, classification was was correct and if there was anything else which they're missing. So if they've they, 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 if it's been a tech has been classified or or, or a thread has been classified uh, a couple of different ways, they can they can check to see in case anything else was uh, in symbiosis with with either of those classification approaches. And therefore, uh, in simple terms would be if there was a um, piece of malware which was being distributed uh, and that was classified correctly, you could reach that back in, as, as a piece of um, as a crimeware network which is not just distributing that particular piece of malware but may, maybe distributes other pieces of malware uh, <clears throat> and you can go back through within your forensics uh, and piece together um, things which may have happened which you now know about or take steps to uh, take take steps to mitigate whatever um, whatever the next attack might be or the damage might be um, which is in relation to uh, the attack which is which has already come so yeah So other issues which are prevalent in uh, carrier cyber or other other big topics in carrier cyber, the, the network itself, it's a, as mentioned previously, it's a multiple site mesh topology. It, it isn't as simple as a uh, as a single pipe with uh, with a couple of files on the end. I mean, you have uh, high availability, disaster recovery, all of these different things. You know, kind of resilience is built into the networks at various levels. You know, physically, geographically, uh, logically. Uh, these things are all built into the network, so the the the, uh, the network has got uh, um, a suitable level and depth of resilience to it. Also, there's a question which comes up: if you're a carrier, what do you want to protect? So actually, you don't want to be protecting every. You don't want to be uh, stopping, or even if you had the opportunity, would you want to stop every single threat going through the network? And the answer typically is no. You actually only want to be protecting your own logical, physical and virtual network assets. You want to be protecting traffic moving between zones potentially or, you know, kind of security zones or segregated areas of the network. And you only want to be protecting certain customers and certain peers. There may be that you have a service which is available to certain customers where you clean, their tra clean, the, uh, clean the, 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 the traffic for them for threats. Uh, there might be something where uh, you're uh, you're letting all traffic through uh, because uh, a, a certain customer is just looking for a, a high bandwidth um, connection and, and not looking for any kind of uh, influence or streaming or, or horizontal segregation of the traffic in any way, shape or form. They want the traffic completely uh, untouched. Also, the carrier as a provider of, of traffic uh, has, has a unique... Um, a challenge which it faces, which is that the IP classification is diverse. As, as mentioned previously, the numbers or the number of the, the, the diversity of applications and devices that there are on the uh, on the internet and on on networks is absolutely enormous. Uh, and come with that, there are huge volumes and huge volumes of, of discrete threats and threat families. It, the amount of threats is enormous, but also the, the, the breadth and depth of threats is enormous far deeper than you would find in a smaller network or in a um, or in an enterprise network. But also due to the infrastructure which is in place in a carrier also subject to certain types of protocol misuse which aren't prevalent in other networks such as uh, the operating OSI uh, open standards interconnect model uh, layer 4 and layer 7 uh, so that would be and DNS misuse so that would be um, customers potentially misusing your network or the services which you operate uh, you offer at a very very low level so how what are the things which we can do to to work within either of these boundaries or to or to to mitigate uh, and and some observations so in a multiple site mesh topology there are often multiple user equipment access points lots and lots and lots of open network uh, effectively, which which means there's limited pinch points to defend. You know, as as mentioned, there isn't a sort of single pipe going through the middle of the network which you can which you can defend against. However, that can work in your favour because the network itself, although it's a mesh topology, it can also be a mesh defence. And using things things like BGP flow spec, you can make 
uh, a threat appear in one part or have detect a threat appearing in one part of your network and effected a, a suitable defense over all of your network uh, and, uh, and and prevent it um, uh, and prevent it going any further. Uh, also, it means that you can defend multiple access points concurrently. However, you have to be aware of capex and opex considerations, capital expenditure, and operation expenditure considerations when deploying CyberKit. Trying to put, trying to break down cyber equipment and putting it at multiple access points can often be uh, a very difficult proposition to to maintain a, a suitable. Uh, uh, security strategy and enforce that strategy. For a start, it can be very expensive if you've got a multi-hundred gig network and your your uh, tools which you're using scale up to five or ten gig. Uh, that spirals out of control very very quickly with capex and uh, with capital expenditure buying the kit. But also, those tools need to talk to each other to understand putting threats into context in other places in the network. So if one one firewall or one tool or whatever it is, is is detecting a threat, then the other tools really should know about it and they should be controlled by a, 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 holistic, um, a holistic intelligence in order to be effective. And again, the carrier owns the playing field. You guys own the playing field. So this means because you've, you've scaled out your network, because you've designed your network, use that, use that architecture in your own, uh, as, as effectively as possible in your side of the, uh, of the battle. So what to protect? Well, you guys know what you want to protect. Uh, you already know this uh, and you, 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 you know, the, this is not a, uh, this is not something which, which, uh, uh, which you need to be told. The, the, you, you already know uh, which um, assets you need to be protecting. You can classify, you can, re you, you know how to classify and tag them. Uh, you know, whatever they are, assets, customers by IP address or, or, do, or range like the SIDA, the IP ranges. You can classify them by domains and VLANs and protocols. Now we call all of these, uh, 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 an asset which you're which you're protecting or assets which you're protecting or, or classifying i should say um uh by the ip addresses um ip addresses and ranges and domains and vlans and protocols or any combination of those um entity sets we call those entity sets so hey look here is an entity set uh they don't have to necessarily be provisioned they can be discovered as well um, they can, you can discover the topology of the network. So, you, for instance, by tapping IP fix, uh, you can discover the topology of the uh, routing infrastructure of the network. But you can also discover the uh, attacking network topology if it's a botnet. So it works both ways, and you can classify a botnet as an entity set, and therefore you can start dis you can start analysing and and treating it and fighting it as a single entity, not as a whole series of disparate zombies but as a single entity a single entity with a known capability because you can you know what it looks like you know what the traffic like looks like from there you've seen the attacks from there they don't deviate from this norm uh, 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 and you can defend against that much much more effectively if you're only dealing with one entity that you're defending against or one entity that you're analyzing uh, rather than multiple ones and continually trying to piece them together so the carrier is a provider of IP traffic. Well, in order to be effective, and the huge volumes of threats, in order to be effective, the, the platform must be up to date with the latest Intel rules and reputations. It must be continually updated uh, and not go out of date in any way. Uh, the latest Intels and rules and reputation will be, should be able to be as living as the traffic which they're looking at. Uh, we never, we, we don't ever say that uh, within any of the uh, 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 any of the customers we talk about. We never, we never say that you know it's suitable to update your rule sets every week. Uh, you know, you should be looking at something which can update rule sets without any loss of operational performance um, in a it, within the minutes or the hours scale. N nothing, nothing more than that. Anything more than that, and you potentially could be going out of date. Now, in the terms of the infrastructure with specific threats to carriers. One of the things which we've been mentioning is, mentioned is DNS, uh, and there are some really bespoke threats. For instance, if you see a single large uh, one-off flow, um, one-off DNS flow, a large number, uh, 
large byte flow, uh, the DNS flow carrying a lot of data, uh, and it's a one-off. It looks like DNS tunneling, but if that happens continually, it looks like DNS misuse. So potentially one of the one of your customers could be trying to scroll and tunnel their data over DNS continually to bypass uh, billing or charges relating to data because perhaps DNS is not um, scrutinized in the same way the same way as other IP traffic. Uh, and that we see that we have seen that fairly fairly frequently. It's 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 not unusual to find uh, people taking uh, or or entities uh, taking liberties with. Uh, misusing protocols. So in terms of entity sets, this notion of uh, things which are grouped by IP addresses, dom uh, uh, domain names, IP ranges, uh, protocols and, and VLANs and the like, well what are they? Uh, well you can group things like subscribers and users, you can group IoT devices, virtual network operators, specific customer subsets, certain types of handsets, certain types of user equipment, certain manufacturers. You can even group, on a, on a telecoms level, IMEIs, and that proves particularly useful for things like IoT devices, because then you can track, tra tra or you can uh, analyze both uh, a customer's IoT devices or even more specifically than that, certain types or certain manufacturers of IoT devices. Uh, recently, there was a um, HCSEC uh, uh, advisory group who, who are a UK uh, organisation, uh, government organisation who monitor um, overseas kit um, in UK networks. They recently said they recently came out and said that the, the risk of uh, particular uh, third-party implementations of IoT devices was concerning um, due to the uh, due to the lack of um, oversight and scrutiny in, in the security aspects of the IT devices. So being able to group those types of devices or those ones particularly at risk for, for, for extra scrutiny would be very very useful. Within the network itself you can you can group certain things like phys the physical network or discover the physical network, the routing infrastructure for instance. Then there's the logical network, as you say, like VLANs and horizontal network segregation uh, for security layers, so different environments, different services which are being provided within those environments. And then there are these sort of services and applications which sit on top of that, so for, for VoIP services maybe, or for, uh, for web services, uh, all of those sort of things, um, you know, kind of uh, application services of, of any description, any kind of IP services. But being able to group those together is, is extremely useful. Uh, Again, with the internet side of things, grouping is again critical. You can group your peers, so your VoIPing peers or your uh, or any uh, any LANs which you're connecting to. You can group things like IoT devices on the internet, uh, group social media or applications, or even parts or subsections in the entirety of CDN network, content delivery networks. Then, of course, there's the operational technology and critical national infrastructure side of things. So you can be able to group manufacturing plants, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of, yeah, sort of factories and things like that, and the and the operational technology, robots and, uh, and the devices which uh, exist within those, uh, and being able to uh, analyze and, and, and respond to those. All of these things enable us. Uh, there's there's power as well in there, utilities, transport, all these sorts of things. Um, and being able to group those things together and treat them as a single entity enables an effective security operation. It significantly clears down the picture for a, a security operations, um, a, a security operations of an organisation. And as mentioned previously, doesn't have to be uh, the good stuff or the the the, 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 the it, can, it can be malfeasance or nefarious networks and elements that you're entities that you're characterizing, you're classifying, such as botnets like Mirai and Zsbotnet and whatnot. Uh, and these are, you know, kind of delivering all sorts of uh, crimeware and malware, you know, providing um, platforms for denial of service attacks, that sort of thing. Uh, and it can be any kind of threat network. It could even be um, an overseas network, which is uh, known particularly, which is particularly, uh, particularly bad for for the quality of its traffic, the, dense, the threat density is, is, is within the traffic which it's provided is particularly high. Being able to qualify, qualify and quantify that uh, and treat that in its own right as an entity set or that the traffic on that, that network in its own right 
as Nancy says, very, very useful for clearing out the picture. Uh, uh, it also enables you, as I say, to defend at a very, very high level, not defending individual items, but defending uh, potentially entire network, defending against the entire networks or entire entities, uh, makes security operations particularly effective and, 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 and a surgical uh, use of resource in the response. So within Carrier Cyber as well, there are many, many endpoints, millions and millions of pieces of user equipment and internal endpoints. And there's a lot of things to monitor. As mentioned previously, if you could block all the threats, would you? Well, it, that's both a technical and a political question, it's driven by all sorts of policy decisions internally, but also services which are available, um, and also the ability, the simple ability for any tool to block uh, threats if you could. Uh, and there's some technical challenges, significant technical challenges with that, notably around the latency and decision making of deciding any given any given internet session, any, any given flow, network flow, is in fact threatful and then blocking. And what types of threats are you? So natting, uh, as mentioned in the uh, very early on, this can cause an awful problem with tying back a, uh, a target from a target, tying back to an individual device which may have um, uh, which which is which was uh, mounting the attack or part of a part potentially part of a botnet that was mounting an attack. Uh, this has become particularly problematic uh, with uh, the rise of IoT um, and uh, and five uh, G four G into five G networks um, and IoT eSIMs. These the the blocks and blocks and blocks of SIMs which are provided to our you know IoT vendors and they scale them out. Uh, with uh, without the uh, an oversight and the and the security which they place upon these uh, devices, uh, they can be compromised very easily. Uh, and then if you've got an easily compromised device which is hidden behind a NAT, that you've got a recipe for a very very tricky uh, forensic and 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 security mitigation um, availability to you and, and, and uh, effectiveness. Uh, so clearing up that picture is is, is critical. And as mentioned previously, treat botnets and their zombies as single entity sets. That makes life much, much easier. So group, as we described, group your, group your the endpoints, user equipment, customers, physical links, manufacturers, group them all to simplify the picture. We have a, um, an interesting uh, discussion internally, an interesting thought um, piece of thought leadership internally which we term Schrodinger's user equipment after Schrodinger's cat. Um, simply put, a piece of user equipment when it's functioning correctly has a positive value to the network and the carrier. A compromised or misbehaving piece of user equipment has an inherent negative overall value to the carrier potentially. At what point does a malfeasant piece of user equipment turn into a good piece of user equipment uh, without knowing exactly what state it's in, uh, if it's been compromised, it can be both positive and negative at the same time, hence uh, Schrodinger's user equipment. Uh, and that's interesting in its, in, its, in its own right that even a single piece of user equipment can be both bad and good potentially. So whilst blocking threats is political and technical, there are some threats which always want to be blocked. Protecting your own assets is a given. Also, as I mentioned, you may be providing security as a service to customers and peer networks. There's an inherent reliant or there's an inherent requirement on brand value protection in order for the business to have a longevity, especially as a, as a communications business bearing data. The data which you provide should be of a good enough value that it enables your business to continue functioning. We have another piece of thought leadership which is called the network threat, threat density. The network threat density is actually understanding what, how many threats there are on your network, whether that, whether that, 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 that number is rising or falling, uh, and how severe um, that, uh, those, those threats are within the network. If you're dealing predominantly with delivering spam or denial of service, they have an uh, multiple denial of service tax. The volumes were like, large, well, large amounts of volumes, but, but what is the relative severity of, uh, of that data? Or relative severity of that traffic? 
but also if you're blocking threats, then accuracy and severity is key. You must be blocking the right threats. You must be blocking the right traffic, which has been classified, categorized, and put into a severity and triaged uh, suitably so that when, you, when, the, when the decision is made, either human or machine, to block that threat, the accuracy is key. So the NATing, the IoT sim specifically, but it, but it does affect all user equipment uh, behind a NAT, uh, needing to know who did what is critical. But IoT misuse does cost money. IoT misuse is extremely expensive. Uh, it, it, it rises, it, it can saturate networks, it can, um, the, the, the hardware it itself can be used for crypto mining or crypto jacking, all sorts of things. Um, uh, uh, all sorts of all sorts of nefarious activity, and it, it, it does cost money. If you're correlating, or you're, you're you're working your way back through the NAT in a forensic investigation, so correlating the activity uh, internally and externally to the network, while you cross the NAT, and then to a specific subscriber active, subscriber is critical. So it's not just about knowing which IP address did something, but if it's a telecoms network, knowing which subscriber did it is also. Uh, critical within that. So botnets and zombies and entity sets, well what we're talking about is both compromised user equipment internally to the network and the internet uh, threat networks. As mentioned previously, being able to map the attack capability of a botnet enables an aggressive defence on your behalf. Uh, and is one of the few times when you can really get aggressive uh, and, and fight these things um, from a uh, from a more assertive uh, standpoint. It, it, it's it's incredible. However, bandwidth equals money. So whilst all of we're saying all of this, the more bandwidth that any entity consumes, the more they must be charged, or the more you can they they, they often are charged. For consuming that bandwidth so there is a delicate balance and that brings back in the blocking of the threats being both political and technical but bandwidth is money and data rates are rising and it's worth pointing that out so if we move on into some of the some of the things which we've seen recently uh, so crypto jacking is something which we've seen recently uh, <coughs> we uh, we saw uh, coin hive um, and, uh, and router, uh, and what we saw was we saw uh, HTTP JavaScript or JavaScript over HTTP um, minor, uh, JavaScript minor over HTTP being injected, uh, and we saw the, uh, the cryptographic hash calculation results. Uh, uh, we saw those getting moved backwards uh, to the consuming entity, but we also saw some art poisoning uh, of, a, of, of, a, of a router, um, uh, and then the hash result flows coming back, uh, and we we. we piece this together and the platform pieced it together by uh, looking at flow reputation, um, a combination of sort of flow reputation, uh, looking at the a network zone transgression uh, and the anomalous activity, which was just too rhythmic, as you can see there, it was too rhythmic and, uh, to, to, to be normal um, in, a, uh, in a, an, an internet and a traffic profile, which was continuously volatile and, 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 and full, of, uh, full of entropy. Um, this was particularly interesting because uh, there has been a significant rise in crypto jacking. So, uh, for those um, who, who who are not aware of what crypto jacking is, but crypto jacking is utilising uh, CPU or, or um, unauthorised use of uh, processor uh, in whatever it is, whether it's an IoT device, a, a router, a critical uh, an infrastructure router, or, or whatever it is. It's it's using those the CPUs which uh, and the processors within those to um, calculate hashes, uh, cryptographic hashes for use uh, in um, cryptocurrency uh, transactions, uh, validating for cryptocurrency transactions. Uh, and there is a material gain or there is a financial gain, a, a reward which goes to the, to the, uh, the controller of, uh, uh, of the, the, the results of the hash flows, the, the, the person who's doing the crypto jacking, uh, and they get a, a, a gain in the form of um, a reward for doing this for the services of the of the, of the cryptocurrency network, uh, and they will get typically, you know, kind of uh, pieces of um, uh, units of that cryptocurrency. 
Now, as the market rates um, or the market values of cryptocurrencies have increased so dramatically recently, uh, there is a, a more substantive gain to uh, to doing crypto jacking. You know, there's a, a, a simple put: the the financial number is bigger and bigger and bigger, and as big as it's ever been, really. Uh, as mentioned previously, we've seen we see a lot of multi-vector attacks, uh, and, and this is a really good. This was a particularly very, very, very neat one, where there was uh, we saw um, threats which were being identified with all sorts of. Uh, uh, there was an alert which went off uh, looking for. DDoS SIM flood, recognizing a denial of service SIM flood and a DDoS UDP flood uh, to a particular um, destination. Uh, but we also saw some botnet command, we saw some botnet command and control flows. Um, and we were looking at what the threats which are being classified um, and the related um, physical and logical network components are being used. Uh, but what got prioritized out of all of this was a single flow for data exfiltration via D a DNS tunnel. Uh, the DDoS was actually a decoy for the whole thing. Uh, and this really uh, bears down to uh, one of the um, items which was raised right at the beginning of this webinar, uh, which is uh, really you cannot sample um, and uh, expect to be able to see, uh, have the full visibility which is required. That data exfiltration took place over a single flow. Um, so there would have only been a one in eight thousand uh, chance of of actually uh, of actually capturing that flow if you're if you're using uh, sort of one in eight thousand uh, sampling flow sampling, um, and and, and th this was this was this was very striking, um, but it's a very very neat example of, of multi-vector attacks where there's a few different types of attack in place, not just multi-vector denial of service, but there was another dimension of the threat um, or the overall attack, which was the, the which was the day tracks via a uh, DNS tunnel. Um, and as you can see, the, you know, kind of in, in this particular in, in instance, the, the severity of the, that particular data exfiltration, which pushed up in severity high uh, as being the top severity in the, in the right hand panel there. So what can you do about it? I mean, you know, it's great that we're talking about, uh, you know, kind of being able to detect all these things. But what, one of the things which you, you can do about it is you can, you can use your network as a mesh defense um, to these, you know, what potentially are mesh attacks. Uh, and, and this is really, really good uh, sort of ri uh, rising technology which is being uh, being deployed. Um, and it's the BGP flow spec rules, and BGP is Border Gateway Patrol. And effectively, what you're being able to do is these is the the, the routing infrastructure uh, can take rule sets um, such as um, flows to this particular target using this particular source port and this layer four protocol, um, drop all those. Um, and, and it can take, there's a whole range of rules which you can take. That's a very simplistic one, but a very effective one. Uh, what it enables, it enables the uh, network to be um, uh, self defending um, uh, and being able to be mesh defensive. Uh, so, in this particular example, uh, what you've got is you've got the initial um, DDoS attack flows uh, going through to the target, but the, that, that traffic's being tapped and very, very quickly, like in a sub second um, in your uh, detection engine. Or in the detection engine, uh, you can detect that there's an anomaly in the traffic profile to that target, and immediately send down a, a BGP flow spec rule to all of the routing infrastructure all around the the multi sites or uh, you know kind of all all around the network, uh, and then the main bulk of the attack rises up. Um, uh, but uh, by that stage, the BGP flow spec rule is already in place, and the routing infrastructure just simply um, Touch, drains all that into a remotely triggered black hole, um, and therefore the target service has been maintained. Uh, and that's a great example of you don't need to be rolling out endless amounts of cyber equipment. What it use your network, it's your playing field. You know, use it uh, to your own advantage. Uh, and that's a, a really good example. It, it, it's also a, a mechanism for actually stopping uh, this, uh, stopping these these particular attacks. So, just a roundup of uh, what we've been talking about. So, uh, you want to be tuning uh, your tools uh, for security operations, uh, network operations, and forensics, uh, but don't compromise. Uh, so, don't sample, uh, don't reduce your threat visibility, uh, 
maintain the purest information, the, 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 the most digestible information, uh, the best information, the cleanest information to each one of those teams in order for them to affect their primary function the most effective. Group, either by provisioning or auto-discovering, logical and physical network assets, your customers and the peers, and botnets and zombies, or high density threat networks elsewhere, such as um, particularly, uh, uh, you know, kind of maybe overseas networks, which have got a particularly high threat density. Uh, and within multi-vector attacks, differentiate the targets, but group the attacks. Implement automatic, automated triaging of the threat and attack severities. So it enables your, your uh, security operations teams to be looking at what the most uh, critical elements are that they need to be responding to. Uh, and, and applying their resource in a surgical and precise way and the most effective way to mitigate and respond to any security incidents. It is your playing field. I keep, we have said this repeatedly. It is your playing field. So use your own network as a mesh defense using things like BGP flow spec. And of course, sub-second alerting and querying. The faster you can get the information to the decision making, the quicker you can affect and the more act, the more uh, effective your response will be. Now just a, a couple of slides extra which the uh, our sales team uh, ensured that I put in. Uh, we do have some products in this area. Um, so we have uh, from the ground up uh, we have a, a flow probe which is a uh, uh, an enriched IP fix probe um, which runs at full line rate one-to-one -one, um, no sampling. We have a CERN, which is an intrusion detection system using uh, open source rules and uh, traffic rules. And uh, it's also a packet recorder, so you can trigger packet recording on, on rules. Uh, we have uh, the TDAC, which is, uh, security, which is an analytics platform. Uh, there is a shunt probe, which is coming through the skunk works or black ops area of our R&D department. Uh, and these things all fit in with that framework which we described to the stakeholders trying to provide the, those stakeholders with the most effective um, and least latency um, information, the most effective and the cleanest information to them, or, or even triaging and doing, the, doing a lot of the things which we spoke about. Uh, if you add in a NAT into the picture, uh, we do have capability to, um, to correlate traffic across a NAT and uh, and then to a subscriber as well so even if you've got a nat it's not a, it's not that much it, it isn't a, it, it enables us to get around that particular niche but very very tricky problem um, and uh, the flow probe is the uh, thing which sends down the bgp flow spec uh, uh, rules to the uh, to the network infrastructure the routing infrastructure so just to summarize the, the, the products, the, the flow probe is two times 100 gig in a one year, provides unsampled and enriched flow records, uh, a huge number of concurrent flows, it works at, at line rate. Uh, it supports detunneling, um, as you can see, the TTP and GRE, uh, IP and IP, MPLS and things, uh, and provides some layer seven visibility within that. Uh, there are other variants which include uh, 10 by 10 gigs uh, and also uh, options, as, as just mentioned, for, 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 for cross and subscribe correlations. Uh, the TDAC is fundamentally analytics and storage. It handles millions, it's horizontally scalable. Uh, it handles millions of events per second uh, from different data sources, uh, but fundamentally from the flow probe and the CERN. Uh, it's scaled out into petabyte scale uh, uh, and, and onwards. Uh, it does provide sub-second alert and querying latency um, on uh, anomalous behavior and um, uh, 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 or threats, I should say, just on, just on threats, um, and uh, which in, does include anomalies and uh, traffic reputation, so on and so forth, in a multi-layered multi, multi, um, multi approach to threat classification. Uh, and it does provide uh, sub-second uh, query latency as well to network operations and, and, and some forensics. Uh, it comes with a government standard application security, um, which is important. And the tool is designed to mirror both the network and the stakeholders. So you can configure the tool, you can configure the platform. So it exactly um, mon mirrors the stakeholders. That includes being able to limit uh, certain uh, certain users, certain teams, uh, to specific specific areas of the data sites, specific areas of the data set, specific types of data, specific alerts, that sort of thing. But also it sort of um, it will automatically discover 
elements of the network or the surrounding network. Uh, then there is the CERN, which is a four times 10 gig, um, as mentioned, it's the IDS and packet recorder, uh, it runs off uh, Suricard snort rules, uh, and it can generate alerts and PCAP. Uh, and it has a nasty thing, which is a two and a half second or 2.4 second back in time buffer. So if an alert or a, if a rule is triggered partway through a flow, it can go back in time to the start of the flow and pick out uh, and start recording from then. So you got the whole flow rather than just from the point that the threat was uh, discovered. Um, that is it. So there are dem demos and evals uh, available. Uh, please just get in contact with us with, with us at uh, sales at telesofttechnologies.com if you'd like a demo evaluation or if you or if you have any questions or comments, um, uh, they'd be gratefully received. And you can see some of the uh, contact information um, uh, worldwide uh, uh, if you'd like to contact your, your, your local office um, or one of our local offices. Uh, but thanks very much for listening. And uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, we look forward to having uh, more webinars going on in future.